You know, I've attended a couple of these, so I've seen a, a few people speak. I've, I've heard Darius, I've heard Neri Street, and I've watched some of them on video because I wanted to get a better sense of what are the stories people are telling, what is resonating, and what might I have to add to this conversation. And what I realized, not just attending the ones that I attended, but more importantly, watching the videos, what I saw mostly was possibility. The possibility that Darius talked about, the poetry that saved his life, the possibility of being connected to water from the moment you come into this world. And so what I wanna share with you today is about possibility. We have um, a slide, and due to some limitations around technology, it's on this end, and so if you want to move down a little bit just to see some of them, I, I encourage you to do that. There's plenty of room. There's plenty of room there. There's, there's like four seats, there's like three seats here, there's like another three, two there. There's like another one here. Thank you. So the image behind you is a little girl who had no idea about possibility. She didn't have possibility about her life. She didn't have possibility about the world around her. The little girl behind you, by the time she was 10, she had experienced extreme and abject poverty. She had experienced racial discrimination in its most violent forms. She had experienced sexual violence, incest at the hands of her father. By the time she was 10, the little girl behind you didn't know that there was possibility in the world. I want to share, a, she's cute, thank you for that. And she's somber. The first time I saw this image of myself, I was wondering what was Shavara, little girl Shavara, thinking on that day? What was she thinking on that day? Anyone know the story of Jonathan Livingston Siegel? A couple of people, not many. It's one of my favorite stories. When I was about seven or eight, my uncle Dale sent me this hardcover book. He actually sent it to me and my sister and brother. We got gifts together and we got one gift and he dated it. And it's the story of a gull, but not really because it's the story of our humanity. So Jonathan is this gull. And gulls have had this pretty mundane life. They fly, you go to the ocean, you see the gulls. Their entire existence was around flying and circling down and swooping and catching fish. Jonathan was sitting around one day and he was thinking, that can't be all there is. There must be something else in the world. It can't just be that I'm to fly around and swoop down and eat fish and go home and go to bed every night. That can't be what's real. So he starts experimenting with all types of flight and dives. And meanwhile, the flock is saying, what are you doing? You are a gull, and you have limitations. Jonathan is saying, I don't think, I, I don't think that's true. So he's soaring, and he's diving, and he's learning all these new tricks, and he is coming into his own and finding some peace. And he gets expelled by the flock. But the flock says, as all flocks typically do, you will conform, you will be like us, you're not a good fit, Jonathan, swooping and sailing. One of my favorite quotes from Jonathan Livingston Seagull, and it's really applicable, applicable to this little girl, don't believe what your eyes are telling you. All they show is limitation. Look with your understanding. Find out what you already know, and you'll see the way to fly. And if I could have said anything to the little girl behind me, I would have told her that. I would have said there, there aren't limitations and these challenges may feel heavy right now, but look with your own understanding. Your eyes aren't telling you the truth. When I think about how this little girl morphed into the woman next to her, there's a very interesting and storied journey that I'd like to share with you. 
Can everyone see the image behind me? So that's me bending over, trying to turn my little brother's head around. I'm trying to get him to face the camera. That's my sister, Bacardi. But what I want you to focus on is the porch behind us. Do you see the porch behind us? I was six when that photograph was taken. My little brother, Cardell, is six months, and Bacardi is four. And on that porch behind us, well, let me tell you about the house in front of us first. So our house was a four-room duplex. We had a front room, we had a kitchen, we had a bathroom, and then we had the bedroom that my sister and I shared. And we called it a front room because it housed my mother's bed, some milk crates, an ironing board, and a raggedy couch that someone had donated. And right next door to us was this house that you see behind me. And our next door neighbor, Mr. Jack, would sit on that porch. He had a bald head and ruddy skin. Sweat was typically dripping down. He often wore flannel shirts, even in, the wind, even in the summertime in Memphis. And he leaned back on an old rocker. And he scowled. And he had a double-barreled shotgun. And every day that we walked to and from school, he would point that double-barreled shotgun at us, and he'd click it, and he'd call us nigger girls. He'd say, come here, nigger girl. Now, you might be thinking, that is horrible. And maybe that's one of the lessons that that little girl, Shavara, was supposed to learn. But the most important lesson of the time with Mr. Jack on the porch was what our mother said. Our mother said, girls, Mr. Jack is sitting on that porch, and he is mired in hatred and bigotry. And that is his problem until he fundamentally decides to change something within himself. That's his problem. And my little six or seven year old brain, I'm trying to figure out, well, he's the one with the double barrel shotgun and it seems like if he pulls that trigger, it seems like it's our problem. Because we'd be splattered. And when I was about 12, I had an epiphany. I realized that even if he had killed us, if our tiny bodies lay strewn on the front yard, nothing would have changed for Mr. Jack. Because fundamentally, it was his problem. You know, oftentimes we meet someone and we walk up and I say, hi, I'm Shavara. What's your name? Andre. Andre. Yeah. And then the next question usually is what? What do you do? What do you do? And then what? Where are you, where are you, where are you from? Yeah, where, are you from? <laughs> where are you from? I've been thinking about this notion of where are you from? What's more interesting and telling, I think, is who are you from? What if we met people and we introduced ourselves and then we posed the question, who are you from? I'll tell you who I'm from. I'm from Samuel and Rebecca Rutsky, who set sail on the St. Paul from Kiev, Russia in 1902. And first set foot on this American soil. My great-grandfather went to work at a garment factory in New York that made women's blouses and all was well for a little while until he decided to get engaged in a union worker strike for better wages and, and safety conditions. I'm from Eiley and Burrell Bevel, born on a cotton plantation into enslavement and bondage in 1837, bound by slave codes. And when slavery was abolished, they worked as sharecroppers, living a life not much different than the one that they left behind. And I'm from Sue Oren, my mother, who at 20 led one of the first protests and organized the first conference on anti-apartheid South Africa in the United States at the University of Michigan. That was 1965, and divestment actually began 20 years later in 1985. And I'm from James Bevel. My father, as Evan mentioned, played by Common in the film Selma, was behind many of the major strategies of the civil rights movement. The 1963 Birmingham Children's Crusade, 
the open housing work in Chicago in 1965, the right to vote, the march from Selma to Montgomery. And behind me is his Freedom Rider image, arrested in 1961, trying to integrate interstate buses. And right next to that image is an image of him arrested as we move forward with an incest trial that was covered in the Washington Post magazine. And I'm sharing who I'm from because I'm also from Sunday school teachers. And I'm from Girl Scout troop leaders. And I'm from addicts on the corner shooting craps in Orange Mound. And I'm from guards at the penal farm who roughed us up a little bit as they looked through our measly sandwiches before we could go visit our stepfather at the penal farm. So who are you from? Whose blood is coursing through your veins? What historic memory lives in your cells? I want to share an excerpt from a book called Love with Accountability. It was released a few weeks ago. There are 43 authors in this book. I'm one of them. I'm chapter three, if you choose to get it, edited by Aisha Shahida Simmons, who is a brilliant, brilliant author and, and scholar and filmmaker in her own right. And the story I tell in here, and I will say this might be triggering. I will put that out there. The story I, I tell in this book is how I decided to reconcile through the transformative lens of restorative justice, honoring my father's legacy and holding him accountable for the violation on my 10-year-old self. Suffocating silence became my survival. I soon discovered that there was no safety in the dark recesses of my mind where I wandered to escape, wrestling with a burden that became too heavy to bear, not yet discovering my strength. The secret had nowhere to hide. And I began to define myself and the world around me through the complex language of childhood sexual abuse. I know well the weight of secrecy, the intricacy of family, and the difficulty of speaking truth. I am a survivor of incest. I am a survivor of incest at the hands of my father, hands that crafted the 1963 Birmingham Children's Crusade, hands raised in fiery indignation at Brown Chapel in Selma, Alabama, on the night my father urged a crowd of 600 to march and demand that segregationist Governor George Wallace stop disenfranchising Negro people, hands that lay still across his chest after he succumbed to stage four pancreatic cancer. Truth is complex. My father secured my liberation and he betrayed that freedom. Perhaps we both paid too high a price. After my father's funeral, a journalist asked if I loved my father. Speechless because I had never pondered the question, I responded a few days later. I do love my father. I love him for the sacrifices that have enabled me to enjoy political freedom. I love him for his role in the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act and the vote I was able to cast in November 2008 that helped put a black man in the White House. It is also that love that gave me the strength to sit in a courtroom and hold him accountable. And finally, my father is perhaps not the monster I once believed him to be, but more simply a man with human frailty, sexually abused as a child himself, ensnared in a past from which he never healed, incapable of facing himself in the end. My life is forever shaped in immeasurable ways by the fiery, principled parts of him, remnants of love, resilience, and brilliance that helped him shape a movement. My life was altered by his violation and strengthened by my resolve to reimagine love and legacy and use the horror of my abuse in ways that are healing and empowering. Anyone familiar with the work of Brian Stevenson? 
He's a brilliant um, scholar and an attorney, and he's the founder of the National um, Memorial in, in Montgomery for, um, well, there's the two museums. There's a legacy museum, and then there's the memorial for the lynching victims. And so he recently created that, crafted it within the last couple of years, and he runs the Equal Just Justice Institute. He has a brilliant book called Just Mercy that's being made into a film now. It's coming out very, very soon. And one of the things that Brian Stevenson talks about in Just Mercy is he tells his own journey of working with people who were surviving death penalty in America is that we are all better than the worst things we have ever done. We are all better than the worst things we have ever done. And I don't know if you believe that or not, but, but I do. And I think about the things that I've done that caused me shame, that have caused other people hurt and pain, that I wished I could somehow undo. And sometimes in life, we don't get a second chance, but I told you at the onset of this talk that today is about what? Possibilities. Say it with me. Today is about what? It's about possibilities. It's about the possibility that that little girl that I showed you at the beginning would be brave enough to tell her story, would be brave enough to stand in front of a jury trial, would be brave enough to believe that freedom and justice and love still exist despite that violation. And when I think about how the stories I've shared with you in the short time we've been together have manifested themselves and have informed every single step and every aspect of my life. I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my co-creator who's sitting right here in front of me, Phoenix. The image behind you, I'm wearing a freedom scar. Freedom is a fiber art, uh, Phoenix is a fiber artist here in Fort Lauderdale. And as Evan mentioned, she's the reason that we all connected in the first place. And when I saw her shop, she, she um, deconstructs denim, which I think is the best way that I can, can talk about what it is that she does as an artist. And when I saw her work, I thought about the quilts that the women down in, in the Carolinas make. And I wondered if she would partner with me on something called a Freedom Collection so we could tell the story of the Freedom Riders. And so that's the image that I'm wearing behind you. And I've got a couple of things on the screen that have been inspired by Mr. Jack, by my father, by poverty. I was that 19-year-old breastfeeding, taking notes in the back of a college classroom, teaching my son to read in between my courses. And all of that struggle, I have such gratitude. At the very top of the slide, there's an image, and it's a picture. I don't know if all of you can see it, but it's a war zone. It looks like it might be out of a movie that came out last week. In actuality, that's 1968, Washington, DC, when the city was on fire after Dr. King's assassination. 110 cities were burning in our nation. Did you know that? 110, and that's a government tank. Well, my mom, the image that you, you saw earlier, my mom and a rabbi, who's now 86, organized 100 white people because there was a curfew every day at 4 o'clock. And what my mom said was black people were being arrested in droves and white-skinned people could walk freely through the city. And so they knew they needed to do something, so they organized 100 white people. They had physicians going into the streets to pick up black bodies that had been shot and beaten down. They sent white attorneys into the jail to demand a lowering of the bail for that 4 p.m. curfew. White mothers and nurses took in black babies and children whose parents had been arrested or simply lost in the fray. And then they issued which by far is probably one of the most powerful anti-racist statements I have ever heard issued by white people. They said, for 300 years, America has demanded that blacks be nonviolent, even if whites are violent. The greatest American who stood for that position was murdered Thursday night, and now it is time for white America to repay that historic debt, to be nonviolent, 
even if blacks are violent. But instead, President Johnson is sending tanks and helicopters. The troops are not yet strafing Washington, but the mass arrests have already begun. If anything is needed to show the bankruptcy of American racism, this is it. That the United States government is carrying on a military occupation in its very own capital. Let's sit with that for just a moment. About a year ago, I was talking to my mom on the phone and I, I said, hey, can you put your hands on your FBI report? I need it for something I, I'm working on, your FBI file. I hadn't seen it since fifth grade. I took it to school. Anyone remember show and tell at school? So people take things like what, like hamsters, they take their grandmother's shawl. Well, I took my mother's FBI report, I got sent to the principal's office, they called my mom, all oh, hell broke loose. I thought everybody's mother had an FBI file. Well, Sue couldn't put her hands on her FBI file last year, but she did say, I've got something else that I think you might find just as interesting, and it was a 15-page document about this strategy. And so just a few months ago, I traveled to Washington, D.C. with my mom, with the rabbi, who, by the way, was just arrested a few weeks ago with Jane Fonda doing environmental activism and justice. So the week that we're traveling D.C., I, I get a, a call and an email from the rabbi, and he says, Shavara, Shavara, dear, I've been arrested, but no worries. I'll be there. I'm like, you've been arrested? I said, what happened? And he sends me the headline. It's like the Philadelphia Inquirer. The headline reads, elders arrested in front of ICE detention center. He was dressed as the Statue of Liberty, alongside his wife, who's a rabbi, and two other Jewish people, all four of them dressed as the Statue of Liberty, barring entry into the ICE detention center. 100 elders. He's still doing the work. This was 1968, my mother's 76 this year. And when I think about what propels me in this moment, it's the rabbi, it's my mom, it's my father and, and Dr. King, and it's Rosa Parks and Diane Nash. And it's all the people that came before and in between, and it's all the folks from whence I came. It's back to that question, who are you from? I'm from activists, and I'm from leaders. Who are you from? Under that, and Evan mentioned it briefly, the, the White and Woke and the We Are Straight Allies campaign, and I'll just talk about them really, really briefly, but that work is a continuation of the work that began while I was in the womb. And I've only recently discovered that. I'd moved to Jacksonville, Florida in 2012, and the city was embroiled in fierce debate about passage of a human rights ordinance. And so what that really meant in layperson's terms is that Jacksonville, Florida was the one large city in the state where it was legal to discriminate against the LGBTQ community in housing, employment, and accommodations. And you know, who am I from? I'm from Samuel and Eileen and Jim and Sue. And it didn't set right with my soul. So within two months, I created a whole national campaign with people like Gloria Steinem and the CEO of SunTrust Bank and rabbis and Muslim scholars. And what I will tell you, in the time between 2012 when I began the campaign and 2017 when that policy passed, 12-6, we changed hearts and minds. Folks had faith evolutions. Families were reunited. One of the things that came out of that campaign is a really beautiful documentary that I produced that just premiered in Memphis, Tennessee at the Alflix Film Festival. It tells the story of a woman named Denise who transitioned 30 years ago. She's 69 now and she came forward publicly with her story three years ago at 66. Her British brother-in-law is in the documentary and one of her twin daughters and her nephew and her older sister. And the most powerful part of the story, 
She's talking about how she had found a faith community. No worries if, if you're not spiritual or led by faith, because this is just about community. She finds a faith community, and she says, I'm, I'm tithing, and I, I, I find love there and peace. And a nurse from the hospital where she was transitioning takes her paperwork and gives it to the pastors who call her in. And she says they're grappling, and they've, they've got the Bible open, but they, they can't find transitioning because God doesn't talk about that, no matter what God you serve. And they gave her a sheet of paper, and they said, Denise, we need you to sign this paper because we can't keep you safe. And this is one of the most compelling moments of this documentary. She says, I took it, and I, I was going to sign it because I just didn't want to lose what I had. How many of us are willing to sign it because we just don't want to lose what we have? Even if signing it means we're signing away our life. Even if signing it means we're signing away our conscience. She said, I, I almost signed it because I didn't want to lose, lose what I had. The White and Woke campaign, on the heels of the success, and I don't mean just the success of the 12-6 vote, but the success that we had changed community. We had changed hearts and minds in Jacksonville, Florida, in a city that was homophobic and bigoted and transphobic. So I was thinking, shit, I'm on a roll. Edit that shit out, please. Darn it, I'm on a roll. What would it look like to organize white people in the same way, to have them think about allyship and solidarity. And the first thing that happened was people said, well, Shabara, you got to change that name. That white and woke sounds really, really radical. And not only did I not change it, but I trademarked it at the insistence of my brother, Cardell. They said, you know, people aren't going to, they're not going to want to be a part of this. It just sounds too radical. We had eight sold out waitlisted trainings, eight hours a day how to dismantle the racial hierarchy. And then Deutsche Bank called and asked if we could come in and do some training. I said at the beginning, this is about possibilities, right? This is about possibilities. And at the bottom is from swastika to Jim Crow, which has a new iteration here in South Florida as from Sinai to Selma. A lot went down in Jacksonville, Florida. There was a lot of work to do. And I was at an exhibition one day, and this is about possibility where you are. You don't have to be born, right, into greatness and a kingdom. You just have to be able to use yourself and whatever gifts you have. I'm in a museum, and there are two exhibitions, and one is called Vardy Kahana, One Family, the first time ever in the United States from an Israeli artist. And the centerpiece, if you can imagine, a very large photograph of three sisters side by side. It's the 60s based on the bouffant hairdos. And each of them has an arm upraised. And on their arm is the tattoo from the concentration camp that they survived. And all around them are images of family members who lived because these three sisters survived the concentration camp. Down the hallway, was another exhibit of black and white photographs from the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, Georgia. Civil rights photographs. And I'm in the museum and, and what I'm realizing is because not just was my city polarized, but we live in a very polarized nation, particularly right now. And I was thinking it is possible that Jewish people will throng to this exhibition. They might trickle down to the one down the hall, but not make the connection that there was shared struggle, shared oppression, and shared liberation. And conversely, black people might go to this smaller exhibition and maybe make it down the hall, but might not make the connection. And so I had this amazing idea. What would it look like if we brought these communities together? So the executive director of the museum, she was all on board. Her board was not. They said, don't you dare do this. This is too radical and stop being friends with that Shavara Oren. And she says, we're doing this. 
There's a book and a film of the same name, from swastika to Jim Crow. I knew the book, was vaguely familiar with the film. So what did I do? I Googled it. That's what we always do when we're looking for information in the world today, right? And I find the filmmaker, Stephen Fischler. He's in New York. He's an Emmy Award-winning filmmaker, graduated from NYU. Martin Scorsese was his mentor. He's a big deal. And I'm on his website and I send him an email. You know when it says, contact us if you need more information. So I thought, shit, I need more. Edit that out too, I'm a cursor. Darn it, I need more information. And so I tell him, I'm here in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm at this exhibition. I send him photographs from the exhibition. I tell him about my own personal history. I've got this white Jewish mama and this black Baptist preacher, father, and I'd really like to bring you down and I want to show this documentary. Then I was thinking, maybe that's not enough. Maybe that's not enough to really reel them in. And so I had one more card to play. So at the very end, I said, oh, and by the way, I know that you created your documentary because you read a New York Times article about the book of the same name. Gabrielle Edgecombe was the author. She died in the 1990s. She was born in 1920 in Berlin, and she was with my mother the day that I was born at Friedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C., so I added that in there for good measure, and he called me the next day. We then created a three-year partnership. We had a screening. We had concerts. We had a soul food Shabbat. Two award-winning African-American chefs preparing kosher soul food in the temple. 250 people attended the dinner, 450 attended the sermon, co-preached by both the rabbi and the pastor. These were folks who had never been inside of each other's faith spaces. This is about possibility. And I was told this was too radical too, you need to call it something else. And I was scratching my head trying to figure out what nicety would you call the Holocaust and the Middle Passage? What sweet, kind words might we ascribe to slavery, enslavement, and annihilation? This is about stepping out and using every single part of ourselves. When I was reading that excerpt, there's a part in there where a journalist was asking me about who I was, and all I could think at the time was, whoever I was to become, I am someone else. And I really believe that my father had taken something that was so core and central to who I am that I would never, ever be able to recover. Whoever I was to become, I am someone else. And I, I believed that narrative for a couple of years. And then one day it occurred to me that that was no longer true and perhaps it was never true. I am exactly who I am supposed to be because of not in spite of incest and poverty and domestic violence and teenage pregnancy and abortion. I am exactly who I am supposed to be. This is about possibilities. This is about possibility. And the image in front of you now, I just wanted you to see it because I want you to see the wide array and what it looks like when we gather all the people, when we invite everyone to be in the circle, to create change, this is about possibility. And finally, I want to leave you with Jonathan Livingston Siegel. If you haven't read the book, I urge you to go out and order it today from your favorite local indie bookstore. Uh-oh. That's OK. Here we are. Thank you. The That's right, it's the Arts District. He says, we choose our next world through what we learn in this one. Learn nothing in the next world is the same as this one. All the same limitations and lead weights to overcome. Learn nothing in the next world and this isn't about whether or not you believe in reincarnation, because this could be about your next moment or your next tomorrow. But if you learn nothing, the next day, the next world, the next moment will be the same as this one. Today is about possibilities. Thank you.